Okay, okay. R is for rock and roll. It doesn't stand up. You see, I should have asked the, uh, the physicist guy about gravity before, because I'm going to talk about gravity for 18 minutes. Here we are. Gravity. <laughs> R is for rock and roll, and I'm here to reclaim rock and roll from the corporate companies and the people who've stolen rock and roll. I'm sure most people in this room have the similar frustrations that we voice about music. Where's, where's it gone? You know, in these times of recession, where's the reaction of music? I'm 51, which makes me not the oldest person in the room, but pretty close to being the oldest person in the room. A lot of people in here look about half my age, but I'm sure you're not. I, came, I grew up in a time of punk rock, and that was, uh, I don't want to get nostalgic because there's great music around nowadays. But the thing about punk rock is your reaction to the times that we were living in. And now I see, no, I see reactions to the time we're living in, in the underground, but not in the mainstream. And that's because rock and roll, has been, and rock and roll is a broad term music, not just guitar music, but all kinds of music has been stolen by the corporate companies who steal everything and spoil it and sell it back to us, sanitized and watered down and ruined. And that's, what, that's my concern. That's why I've been doing, doing my website here, Loud in the War, which is not a corporate company. It's done with no money at all. Because anybody, I'm sure a lot of people in here do websites, realize you make no money out of doing a website. And, that, and unfortunately, that's not the motivation for doing a website. So like, uh, how do we reclaim rock and roll from the big corporate companies who have stolen it from us and stolen the soul of it? The answer is, we can't really. All we could do is mess around at the bottom. Now, when we went for dinner before with the people from this uh, place, I met some people working here, and there's a guy, I'm sure he's in here at the moment, who plays uh, guitar, and he was worried that he would never be good enough to get on the stage and play guitar. Now, I think that's, I mean, that's a brilliant attitude. It's good to hear, but people are so professional and so caring about their art. But also, I think it's an unfortunate mindset. And one of the great things I learned from punk rock was that anybody can make music. No matter how rotten it is, it's still music. And I respect anybody who gets on stage. And I respect anybody who had a guitar here right now and came on the stage and played it. And, 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 was, and even if they're out of tune and sounded terrible and sounded rubbish, it was still been really, really fantastic because at least they did it. And I think there's no such a thing as being like a virtuoso or brilliant. I mean, anybody can sit in a bedroom for 50 years and play 8,000 notes, but it's what it feels like. And that's what's really important. And that's what we've got to reclaim because... The whole thing that's happened with popular culture in the last 30 years is the ex-factorization of popular culture. This idea that you have to stand in front of judges and they decide if your music or your pop or your art is any good. And I say you do not need permission to create art. Anybody can create art. And that was the single most, and this begins with R as well, revolutionary aspect of punk rock. Not the idea of selling loads of records or clothes or anything like that, but the idea that anybody could do it and anybody could create art. Now, this is quite a lightweight, in some ways, thing to be talking about when we've been hearing all the amazing things that people can speak about all afternoon. It's hardly like explaining the origins of the universe and things like that, but in a kind of weird way, music is almost an equal to that because it's the highest, the most elevated art form because anybody can do it, and that's the key to it. It's, it's like communication, which we're rotten at being English, most of us. I mean, as an English like male, growing up in a town like Blackpool, communicating with other people is very, very difficult. That one-to-one -one communication thing. It's, not, it's actually far easier to communicate with uh, 1,500 or whatever there is in here, or even to the back wall up there. That's far easier than talking just to you. That'd be far, diff more, far more difficult. And that's, if, I say to, if I said to you... What are your feelings? And as a male, you go, oh, my God, that's the worst question in the world. You know, when a girl asks you that, it's a terrifying question, isn't it? But oddly, when you can get on stage with a guitar or any, any instrument, you can sing about all those kind of things and all those feelings come out, which is kind of a weird kind of contradiction in our culture, but a fantastic thing. And that's the great thing about pop music and, and art and the pop art culture. And that's, that's what I want to try and get back to when I write about the website. I try to encourage this and all the people, all the young bands that send me music. And let me tell you, I'm lucky because I, because from doing a website, I get sent music continually. And I can hear loads and loads of really great music. And I would argue that we're living in a boom time of music. There's, there's a kind of a, a, a misconception, and mainly because of X Factor, that we hit a dead end and musical culture has run out. And all it is now is people doing cover versions of auto tuners and stuff like that. Of course, that exists. That does exist in TV land. And those people have a responsibility to, like, encourage proper, proper culture. I don't mean high art culture. I hate those kind of terms. 
Because for me, good taste is the enemy of the revolution. The idea that, oh, I've got better taste than you. I'm a very tasteful person. You have no taste at all. I hate that idea. The idea, that's kind of what the people at like The Guardian will sell to you. The, here's, here's 10 things you should like. So you tell your friends that you feel comfortable because you could talk about this kind of music. I hate all that crap. It's, it's, it's about what you feel. I think we need to get an instinctive feel back into our culture again. When you actually have the confidence to listen to something and go, that's total genius, I completely love that. That's what which, which people find very, very difficult to do these days. I think this, has become, this is because we're living in a time where everything's dictated to everybody all the time. And I, I guess we, we are part of this as well by doing a website. We kind of dictate what we feel to people, but we don't tell people that's what they should think. We want people to question everything all the time, which is another thing I learned growing up in punk rock was the idea of questioning. You had to question everything. You had to question the shoes you wore. You had to question the hair you had. Obviously, I didn't question it enough because I ended up pr pretty ridiculous for 51-year-old. But that's just the way it is, you know. Because the only judge is the mirror, isn't it? You look in the mirror. If it looks good, it's right. Don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks. And that's what's important, isn't it? It's a good job, isn't it? <laughs> now, this... Uh, this year, I've been involved in a couple of like, really interesting things in music. Um, been out on a tour, this really fantastic tour. I was a compare on a tour uh, put together by, for, for the people organising a campaign for the 96 people who died at Hillsborough. Now, um, fantastically, the whole thing won in the end. And I'm not saying this tour had anything to do with this. It was just like a rallying of the troops. And about a year ago in Liverpool, we did this amazing gig in an auditorium about this, well, put it a little bit bigger than this, a place called Olympia in Liverpool, if anybody's from Liverpool. Fantastic old venue. And it was uh, this guy called Mick Jones. He used to be in a fantastic punk rock band called The Clash. And he played um, some Clash songs for the first time for 30 years with different guests. And it was such a great gig, a really emotional night. And he was bringing together great rock and roll for a start because they were a great band. And he's bringing together um, people who were actually at Hillsborough that night. The, uh, the bands who made up the people who played the songs, a group called The Farm, for Liverpool, two of them were actually at Hillsborough. When the tragedy happened, it was really emotional, powerfully emotional in a way that rock and roll should be. And it, and it, and it, it sort of connected with the community as well. And I think in a lot of time, the last few years, we've lost that connection. And I say we, because I'm part of the music scene. We, we've lost that connection with the community and it's just been about selling stuff to people and dictating the culture back to people. Now this night was an example of it, opposite of that. It was the idea that, that the music has something to do with people's lives. And it was, it was one of those nights where you saw grown men crying, like as we talked about a minute ago, not easy, is it? You know, we, we don't cry because we're really hard, you know. We don't have any emotions. Well, we do really, that's being sarcastic. And it's one of those nights where everybody did, it was a very misty-eyed, emotional night, very old school. And when I wrote up the website, I said, this is amazing, this, this gives, I'm so proud to be part of this. Um, this is music that had a reason. And from that, we decided to carry on the tour. So we spent all year, Touring around, played Heaton Park, the Stone Roses, had some great guests turning up. The Stone Roses guys did their first ever, or half of me and Brown, John Squire, did their first comeback gig. And the Manchester leg of this tour, Eric Cantona turned up in France and he went on stage. And it's quite weird actually, because he thought Eric Cantona would just rule stage, because he's probably, the, I'm not a Manchester United fan, I'm a Blackpool fan. Anybody here from Blackpool? Hey, there is somebody from Blackpool. <laughs> Seasiders. So, um, so, so, I'm, I'm, I'm out of Cantona, I was the most amazing footballer and an amazing personality. I'm not saying that as a biased thing, that's the point I was making there, because I'm a Blackpool fan, but we, he never played for us. So, um, so he was at the gig, and he's really cool, off stage, big guy, tall guy, like really imposing. And he went on stage, and he just looked really awkward, it was quite odd, he was like a, a dad dancing. But it's still brilliant, because he was there, and he was, he was with the, the, the uh, Night, Hillsborough 9 6 which is important, because he's Man United, and there's that rivalry going with Liverpool, blah, blah, blah all this kind of stuff. So the, the politics aside, it was so important this thing happened. And, um, and eventually, uh, about four weeks ago, the, uh, the, the whole campaign won. It was and what the most amazing about it, and it wasn't anything to do with the musicians. It was just a rallying point. It was just, it was just a point of entertainment. It was it's basically the mothers of the 96 of beating the establishment. And it reminded me what was great about any kind of great rock and roll moment is when people, normal people, take on the establishment and win in a way. You know, when Elvis shook his hips in, nine, in, in the 50s on TV, no matter how contrived that moment was, and the more you read about it, there was kind of slight contrivance to it. It was a really fantastic moment. It was a moment when uh, sex was introduced in middle America, or when the Sex Pistols swore on TV. And I know that sounds incredibly petty when we talk about the things we talk about this afternoon, but it was, an, it was an amazing cultural moment. You know, it's not the fact that they swore, it's the fact they didn't back down, you know, it's the fact 
the, the, uh, the condescending attitude the TV presenter to what the time was like young kids. They didn't like curl up and go, whoa, okay, sorry. They actually stood their ground. And that was a powerful thing that inspired a lot of people at that time. And I don't, I, when I see X Factor, I, it kind of scares me in a way when I see people like so desperate to get those, those four creepy judges to really love them. And to me, that's really wrong. Well, I mean, who would actually feel like some kind of victory because Louis Walsh would like their music? I mean, <laughs> I mean, what, you know, when you see some people and the music's pouring out of them because they're so in love with music and culture and life and they've got an instinctive rush and, and uh, you know, that whole thing about them. He's got none of that at all. He's like a block of ice. It's, why, why would you want to impress somebody like that? I know for a lot of people, that's the only break they're going to get in their lives. In their heads, they think that. But for me, it'd be much more powerful and a better statement and something more exciting to make their own music in front of their own friends and told those people to come to them. You should never get on your knees when you're making music. You should never, or any kind of art or any kind of culture or anything really, or any kind of idea that you have, you know. And this probably goes for people in science as well, because it's interesting we talk about this with, with the science guys before at dinner, and the, the creative process is really kind of similar to music. It wasn't like they got guitars and sang about the beginning of the universe and worked it out that way, which would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, I, wanted, I like to hear that album. It was, it was just the idea that they, they, out of thin air, like when you write a song, you write it out of thin air, it just comes to your head and you go, oh my God, a song, right. Shit, get it down, get it down. The, when, when, when he was thinking about things, he was thinking about the, the first trillionth of a second of the universe that came to his head. And it's the same, weirdly, the same kind of process. He was thinking, oh, first trillionth of a second, instead of the chorus, the second trillionth of a second. It was, it was like that. It was just like getting, getting the idea and making something out of nothing, making something out of thin air, not doing a cover version, not, you know, a, a pleasing little cover version for Mr. Simon Cowell but actually doing something on your own, something that t tells the world about your own personal human experience. That's the power of great culture and great music. And in a way, great, sci in a way, great science as well. Go going against the grain, the idea that you have to be a certain way, you have to think in a certain way. A anything unconventional is interesting, isn't it? You know, when, when, when people, you don't, we don't want to be sheep. I'm sure nobody in this room is a sheep-like person because you wouldn't actually be a thing like this, would you really? I mean, I hope most people in this room are either not agreeing with me or thinking something. You know, I don't, I'm not telling you all the stuff so you can totally agree with what I'm saying. It's, it's the eternal argument, the eternal debate, what is great art and who does it belong to? And it does not belong to those corporate companies. And that's why I want to reclaim rock and roll. For, I want to reclaim it for what it really was and what it really is. And it's, it's reclaimed the grassroots, but in the mainstream, and the mainstream is a danger, and the corporate companies are so dangerous. They're, you know, why can we, how can we trust these people to give us great art and great music when they bankrupt the whole world? You know, it's, it's basically their fault. That, you know, they're the bankers. They're the people, they're the people who can afford Rolling Stones tickets. They're that rich. You know, they're the people who've like, they, they wrecked America and they've wrecked the whole Western civilization. And then, and then they blame it on us. And, that, and, and, that's, and those are the people we're entrusting our culture to. I mean, it's true, isn't it? It's true. Yeah. And, and we're entrusting them with our lives and our culture and our careers and everything that we want to do. And they're wrong. I'm not knocking all bankers. I'm sure there's um, some young students in here who are bankers. And maybe there's a new generation of bankers who might do the right thing. I'm not sure what you do. I'm not sure what goes on in the city of London. I mean, shuffling bits of paper around. It's not like, it's not like real life, is it? It's not like doing proper things, is it? <laughs> <laughs> like, like playing in a band. <laughs> so. These people, the idea of these people actually t telling us what to listen to and how to entertain ourselves is criminal, it's completely wrong. And we have to have a, begins with R, a revolution, or maybe a cultural revolution to, to overturn this. And to, to get back, and I know it sounds like a hopelessly old-fashioned communist ideal, the, the idea of getting back the means of production, but maybe get back the means of production of music and culture. We should own it, it's our culture, it's not their culture. I mean, if you ever meet these people, and unfortunately I have met a few of them, you look through their uh, CD collection, you know, CDs, that's what they used to have years ago when people paid for records. Well, they, <laughs> these, their, their CD collection is like, it's laughable. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I say you shouldn't really laugh at people's CDs collection, but it's, it's really dull, really boring. And these are the people we're, we're actually having to ask for permission to make music. That is wrong. I don't, I don't want those people telling me what to listen to. And they own everything now, the idea, that what I grew up punk rock, it became what was termed alternative culture. And it's not even alternative anymore. You know, you listen to alternative radio stations and they think alternative music is something like scouting for girls. And does anybody know that band at all? Thank God you don't know about them. 
they're really popular apparently they play in stadiums and they're really boring it's just like just because they put have a guitar it's that's meant to be like a bit edgy but you're thinking that's not that's not the way it is you know there's so much better stuff out there stuff that can wake you up and make you feel awesome you know like the greatest piece of music the great pieces of music make you feel so alive in a way that nothing else in the world can it's, it's incredible how the effect it can have on you everyone is touched by music i mean sometimes i'll meet people a bit like my own mother actually who says i don't like music you think wow that is really weird how do you not like music it's a it's, it's not a thing you can make a decision about it's something you just hear it and, it, and it'll move you completely it'll change you into something else you know, it's, it'll, it empowers you as well. And that was the beauty of the punk thing for us when we were younger. It did empower us, you know, it empowered us from just being uh, a bunch of like little worms in Blackpool. And it suddenly made us feel like we could get on stage and play music. And before that point in time, being on stage was something you never thought about. That was just what people in London did or, or, in, or in outer space, you know, the endless universe, which actually, interestingly enough, they think may have an end and maybe other universes and the worm theory, but we won't get into all that because, because, I, because I'm really out of my depth to talk about that kind of stuff. But, um, so we thought it, it, was, it was something that we, it wasn't ours, but then I learned it was ours and we could play it ourselves. And even if it's playing in little church halls and Blackpool to our 20 mates, it was our culture then and we owned it. And I think ownership of your own culture is so important. I think that goes for everybody in this room. You know, if you, if you want to make stuff and you want to do stuff, then just go and do it. I mean, life is really, really short. And as, as a 51 year old, and that's one thing I'm an expert on. I know we're running out of time pretty fast. And I can feel it running out faster and faster all the time. And when, when you're 20, you feel like it's gonna last forever and ever, and it doesn't. And that's what's really terrifying. So, so like anything you have wanted to do, and you're too scared to go and do it, just sodding well, get up and do it because the time will run out. And there's always that idea that I could do it tomorrow, or I could do it next week, or I could do it when I've had 20 Red Bulls or something. Not that I'm not sponsored by them. It's horrible stuff, vile stuff. <laughs> now, I'm definitely not sponsored by them now. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the idea that you, the, the fear, the fear factor, that you should not be scared of anything, you know, and should, should be like prepared. You know, that's a great thing I, I learned from, from, another great thing I learned from punk was you could do anything, you know. We were trained in nothing. I mean, I've never learned to, uh, how to do any of this stuff at all. I and mean, if anybody's ever heard my, some of my records, you'd probably agree that I was obviously never trained in how to do it. But, it was, but, but, but it's a simple willpower of wanting to do it. And, that's, and that was what's the important thing about that. It was the idea that I'm just going to do it anyway. I don't care if you, if you don't like it. I don't care if I don't need your permission. I certainly don't need Louis Walsh's permission to go and make music and create my own art and create my own culture. And the, this is interesting when I spoke to the science guy before because he had the same thing. If you have an idea that contravenes what all the other scientists think, but you're still, you're dead certain that could be something that works. You have to go with it. And that's, that's how I think that's a really important thing to learn from life that you have to, you have to, sometimes you have to go against the flow. And sometimes you have to do things that you see fit yourself, like the mirror. You judge yourself in your own mirror, not what anybody else says. If anybody else says you've got the wrong socks on, what's it got to do with them? It's nothing to do with them at all. And that's, that, that's for me, the powerful lesson. And if we just get into our heads, we can do that and we can take back the, the whole creative process for ourselves. Not, not be passive consumers, you know, where we just buy stuff. It's weird when you go to like a, a big gig in a, in a stadium, which most gigs seem to be these days, you know, the Enorma Drome in Manchester, which, you know, I've seen some good shows in there and that, but sitting in a little plastic chair with people sat next to you, clapping their hands like that, it's, it's not rock and roll, is it? It's, it's, it's shy, isn't it? It's just wrong, you know? <laughs> You, and the bands over there in the distance and they're absolutely tiny, a bit like the people right up there. It's, it's steep. I just know it's a really steep. Hello. It's, it's a really steep room, isn't it? People, are you flying up there? It's really bizarre. Yeah. So, so it's always um, this, this, this idea that everything's so distant and there's no, uh, there's no humanity. There's no communication between things. It's just like big, big bombastic images and big slogans shouted out at people. And then at the end, everyone just files out like this and they walk up the little steps and the little yellow coats push you out the door. Thanks for your money, go home. And oh, don't forget to buy six T-shirts on the way out. But uh, you don't have to buy a record because you nick it off the internet. <laughs> and that's, that's the weird way that modern culture is made, isn't it? It's just like a big like, uh, vacuum cleaner taking all your money off you. And I don't, where, where's the music and where's the love and where's the communication and where's the passion? It's, it's all just sold in like little doses and swapped for the dollar, isn't it? You don't even pay your cash anymore. It's all with a credit card. It's going to take more money off you without, without even noticing. So to me, that's not the rock and roll experience. And it's interesting because I, met, I mentioned that Rolling Stones gig before. And I, of course, being of a certain vintage like myself, I, I, I love a lot of Rolling Stones records. But the idea of going to see them play the O2 Arena when it's about hundreds of pounds a ticket just seems completely 
contravening the idea of rock and roll. When you're that rich, how can you charge that much money? How much money do you actually need? Why can't you just get up there for the sheer joy of playing? We don't mind you charging 20 pounds to get in. You've got to pay the staff, haven't you? Cover a few costs here and there, you know. You know, you've got to pay for mix, champagne, Keith's, well, whatever Keith takes these days. You know, you're gonna, you know there's, there are expenses you've got to think about in these situations. But like, um, but, but the price of the tickets is ridiculous. And this goes on quite a lot across music now. It's greed, isn't it? And we live in a culture where, where greed is like celebrated, isn't it? And like, and this is wrong as well. And the idea you could be famous without having any talent at all. It's not even having any, it's not necessarily talent or having anything to communicate to people. All you've got to communicate is me. Aren't I great? And that's it. And that's, that's the whole, what, what kind of story is that to communicate to anybody? People flicking through celebrity magazines going, oh, look at Cheryl. She looks a bit funny in that picture. It's, it's boring culture. You know, it's, what we don't want to get moved by things and feel things. And you don't feel anything like, look at that. It's just made to make you feel worse and small. It's like, oh, I can never be as good looking as that person. I can never be as talented as that person. But everybody's got a talent and everybody's like really important. And the whole, that's how the whole thing fits together. It's a thing, it's an old fashioned concept, but it's called community and it's called society. The things that, that, that Margaret Thatcher hated in the 80s when she tried to destroy it all, you know. And she, put, she had a pretty damn good go at it and probably, got, and, and probably caused a lot of these cracks in the first place. And, and, but we still feel that, we don't feel that we fit into that kind of world that those people see. And that's what the great, and to me, that's what music reflects back again, because the one thing you cannot put in a box, you cannot like shove it all in and say, behave yourselves, do it like this. Musicians are like unpredictable. We're all a bit crazy, we're all a bit stupid, but we still feel things and, we're, and, and we don't fit into that automating, automating like robotic kind of culture that they want us to. And that's the kind of thing I like to encourage. And I think if we could just get this, um, this would be our revolution. We can just make music on our own terms or make culture or art or anything on our own terms. And then that's, that, that would defeat the whole corporate conglomerates that are just trying to take over our lives. Well, they've already taken them over in a lot of ways, aren't they? Because when you go to a gig, it's always called the O2 Arena or something. You think, surely that used to have a name, that, didn't it? It's not, I didn't know it was a mobile phone I was going to. It's just, it's just like, they're, 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 they're everywhere, they're everywhere, they're permeating in, but, but they still can't beat us because you can't take the spirit from people and the spirit is, is the most important thing. And the spirit, I think, is really reflected in, in rock and roll. And that's, it's because it's, when I say rock and roll, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, because he's got a bit of a quiff, he's talking about making rock and roll music that sounds a bit like Elvis, which was great music, but I'm talking about all music because rock and roll is still a great word for, for music because it's a slang word for fucking. And that's basically what, it's, what music was really. It's, it's music to have sex with, isn't it? You know, Although when you watch, watch X Facts, you think even they even took the sex out of the whole thing as well. You know, it's, it's just like the most sexless, dull kind of program. That, I know a lot of people watching like lying there in the settees on a Saturday night with a box of chocolates watching X Factor. But please don't mix that up with music at all. It's just like, it's just watered down celebrity culture just on your Saturday night TV. And get off your settee, put the chocolates in the bin and go and make your own music. That's, that's what I think you should do. So I think we're getting near the end of my time because um, obviously I don't know how much time I've got. But he's, he's waving at me. All right, mate? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so they say there's no groupies in rock and roll. <laughs> And I've, I've just got this guy here, but we don't want to get too Jimmy Savile about this. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, uh, I came here. I came here to uh, destroy corporate culture, but I just destroyed the letter R instead. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah.